Well, good morning, Central Family. It's good to, good to be back. Good to see you guys. Um, I want to make one quick um, uh, announcement that's in your uh, program, in your bulletin. Next week, we have an incredible opportunity to host uh, a training by Austin Disaster Relief Network, ADRN, which we are involved in. And Richard Blackaby, and it says Henry Blackaby in your uh, program. It's not Henry Blackaby. Uh, it's Henry Blackaby's son, Richard. Richard uh, has uh, worked closely with his dad. Many of you have been through Experiencing God that Henry Blackaby wrote. Richard Blackaby has worked along with his dad through that, through the Fresh Encounter stuff. I, I, I love the opportunity we have to have Richard Blackaby with us next Friday and Saturday. Uh, there will be people from all over the Austin area here, but I'd really love for you to take advantage of this opportunity. If you can come on Friday or Saturday, it's free. Uh, they do ask that you register just to like, make sure they have enough room here, but uh, it's going to be an incredible time. I, I tried to get him to, to speak on Sunday, but he's got to fly out Saturday. I mean, I thought, boy, I, I'd love to, for him to be able to address the central body, especially in the area of revival and spiritual awakenings that he has such knowledge of. So he'll be talking about that on Friday and Saturday. So I just want to invite you. Uh, we get to host it. And so uh, I'd love for it to invite you to come and to be a part of that next week. Well, it's good for us to be back. Uh, for you that did not know, Pam and I have been out the last two Sundays. And uh, man, haven't you been blessed with Jim and Alan speaking? I mean, man, they, we are, we, you got, you got steak the last two weeks. And, and uh, I know it's like going back to grilled cheese or bologna all of a sudden, but, but Man, we have such gifted communicators and men who love Jesus and uh, want to see the body built up and transparent, authentic, and uh, I, I just can't uh, uh, praise God enough for those guys and for others that uh, get up here and speak. But uh, for you that don't know, we... Uh, a year ago, almost, in, in uh, November, when we celebrated 25 years as a church, the, uh, you gifted us with a trip to Alaska, a cruise to Alaska, and we finally got to work that in to our schedule uh, at the, uh, for the last two weeks. And so we were in Alaska, and, and I wanted to take the opportunity, first of all, to thank you once again for that incredible gift. Man, we were blessed with beauty. I know some of you have been there uh, but man, we were so blessed to, to be able to be there. First part of it was a cruise, and then the next part was the inland uh, part of it. Got a couple of pictures, a few pictures here for you. This is us um, uh, up on the mountaintop, just so that proves that we were there. And uh, you can see the, the glaciers off in the, in the background there. Go ahead and go to the next picture. Um, this is uh, Denali, which used to be called Mount McKinley, and then they, they changed it back to its original name, Denali. And Denali is the highest peak in uh, North America. And uh, we are actually, this picture is actually taken about 70 miles away from Denali. We are there in the National Forest, and uh, only 30% of the people that come in, in the National Forest even are able to see it because it's always clouds hanging over it. So that was a great picture to be able to uh, capture that. And, uh, and, and so that's, that's right there. Uh, this is uh, me taking a dip in the uh, <laughs> pool there. Uh, we went uh, uh, watching humpback whales and uh, one had um, crested you know, and blew the blowhole and uh, went back under. And uh, the guy, the captain of the boat says, well, that's, that's about a five minute well, which means he would stay underwater about five minutes. I'm thinking, man, he, he's a mammal, but he can stay under there forever. How does he know? And sure enough, not 20 feet from the boat, the humpback whale comes out, that blowhole goes off. I'm, I'm, surpri I'm surprised nobody had a heart attack. It was that close. To, to what we have, but we saw many, and it's always great to see them take that final dive, uh, get the tail, tail fins there. And then uh, one more is uh, uh, the Hubbard Glacier, as we went into Glacier Bay, and just the incredible 
beauty of that. We, we may be a, a mile out uh, even from the glacier, and uh, you'd hear the, the, the sounds were just so uh, remarkable to hear the thunder and then to see the calving, the breaking off of some of the ice was just incredibly gorgeous. And, and uh, so we got to, to do that. And so Pam and I are just so blessed that you blessed us. And so I thought it would be good to come back and show pictures to the family and uh, just to kind of let you know we were there. And uh, we didn't take these off of uh, the internet. These were actual <laughs> pictures uh, of us being there. And it was a great, great time. But I think it's good to be back. Uh, I say that because we knew we, we flew all night, landed in Austin about 745 Wednesday morning. <clears throat> we knew we were home. It was, uh, you know, 90 plus degrees already. And, uh, and the sun was just beating down and we hadn't seen 70 in uh, 10 days. So it was, it was, uh, it's good to be home. It's always good to be with you guys and, and to, to spend a time of worship and open up God's word with you. And so we were blessed by you. And so we want to come back and just say thank you and, and to bless you. So uh, we do bless you very much. Um, we're going to be back into First Peter today. If you want to grab your Bible, First Peter chapter two is where we're going to be. And I'll get there in a moment. We're going to begin with verse 11, and for you that this, you're catching up on the series a little bit, we're two weeks in, uh, well, this is the third week in to 1 Peter, and I, I'm just going to be transparent here a little bit in what the Lord really put upon my heart, because I've been wrestling with this word. I mean, I, I, I want to wrestle with the Word of God because I believe that every time we open the Word of God, it is so important that it is clear truth that we're getting. And so I was really wrestling with this and, and some of it, what it had to say a little bit, and I'll get into this more. But the Lord all of a sudden this morning uh, just kind of triggered my heart to share this truth because it's a warning. It's the warning. And, and uh, I thought back about Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount when he was teaching. Uh, he did the Beatitudes, you know, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. He talks about all these, uh, these things about blessing of people. And then all of a sudden he stops and he says this, he says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its flavor, it's good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled under the feet of men. If the salt has lost its flavor, and all of a sudden this warning came into my spirit, and it was this, I wonder if we are not close to being flavorless salt. Now, let me, see, let me share with you what I mean by that. You know, thirst comes because of salt. Salt, you want thirst. It, it flavors, it seasons. But I wonder how many people are truly hungry for what we have. They're thirsting for what we have. I don't, I don't see it a whole lot. And if I don't see it, I, I see this as a warning that maybe we are becoming flavorless salt. Maybe what we think we're so good at, we think we're shining a light so bright, it's really not that way. And I, I don't want to just be a bummer on you at the beginning of this message, but, but this is something that would just weigh heavy on my heart because we're going to be talking about how do we live life on mission and, and that's what this whole series is about. You see, Peter wrote this letter to first century Christians. It was probably in the mid-60s. Jesus had been gone for about 30 years. He had not returned. I mean, he, he, he had died. He resurrected. He ascended. But uh, he, we're, here we are, 30 years later. People were dying. These people were scattered. They were no longer in their homeland. They were scattered. He was writing to people in modern-day Turkey. He was writing to them. They were being accused of all kinds of things. They were accused of cannibalism because they talked about the body and the blood of Christ and how they partake. They were, they, were, uh, they were accused of incest because they called each other brother and sister. 
They were accused of immorality because they had something called a love feast, which was the Lord's Supper that they took together. And they were accused of atheism because they would not bow to Caesar. They, they, they said they have a king who is above Caesar. And so they were accused of these things and they were suffering from all of these things. And so Peter is writing to them to encourage them and to tell them that they have a mission while they're here. To, to, despite their circumstances, despite their suffering, God would still use this in their life to make a difference. I think this, I think this letter is written for us today uh, because many of you are going through things and, and not necessarily because of your faith, but because of other things. And you're thinking, man, I just don't fit in here. And, and the, but yet the Lord wants to use you on mission. I hope this makes sense because we're going to be seeing today because what Peter did is he reminded them of who they are, that they are a royal priesthood. They're, they're, uh, they're God's chosen people. They, I mean, he reminds them of our identity and we need to know of our identity all the time. And then he begins to talk about how they're going to be able to live this life of being on mission. And so, um, let me give you a word picture just to kind of start out because if we're going to make impact in a day that's becoming post-Christian, anti-Christian, uh, we, we may suffer for our faith, get questioned for our faith, accused about our faith. How do we make a difference? Well, I was, I was a kid that grew up just loving sports. I didn't worship sports, but I loved sports. You know how certain times you just pick them up and, and, and you just love them. So from, from a little kid, I, I just loved sports. My seasons of the year were not fall, spring, winter, summer. My, my seasons of the year were baseball, basketball, football. It's whatever ball you were going to have determined my seasons. And uh, so I didn't grow up alone there. And one of the things was, is that uh, I had a basketball goal out in my driveway, which was incredible because my uh, stepdad and my mom worked. I would come home. My brother was older. I'd come home uh, by myself. And uh, for me, I love to get out there in that basketball court. I won many NBA and NCAA championships right out there by myself on, on my uh, driveway. But yet, what I learned is when I started playing more, you know, some kids just have ability and some train into ability and some just don't have it. But, but uh, I learned that, uh, especially in basketball, that you have to learn to do what doesn't feel natural if you were going to be a decent player. In other words, I was dominantly right-handed, hand, right -handed, and so... Uh, if I played only with my right hand, I am handicapped. They can just trap me and I, I can't get away. But when you learn to go with the unnatural, the unorthodox, to go with your left hand, now you can start to play and start to um, maneuver because the defensive guy doesn't know what you're going to do. Are you going to go left? Are you going to go right? He can go left or right. In fact, uh, back when when uh, I coached the girls in, in uh, their middle school years here, uh, it was always good if we played another team and they had a point guard that could only go with one hand. Because what we would do is we would force her to go to her weak hand. She'd turn the ball over and go. Now, uh, I could talk about sports all day long, but that's not what I'm, I'm here to do. Here's the deal. I think Peter is getting across to these first century Christians who are suffering and are called to be on mission. He's saying, if you're going to do this, you're going to have to go counter to what feels so natural and go with the unnatural that God has for you. And this will make sense as we get into this. But listen, if you're going to make a difference in your neighborhood, in your job, in your school, if you're going to make a difference, you can't just be like everybody else. It, God has got to use something to make, which feels unnatural for you to make impact. So, let's look at the scriptures. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 17. I'm going to read it all, and then I'm going to come back, and there's three points I want to make. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. 
live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. What I want to draw out of this passage is three things that are going to help us to live on mission and to make a change in this day where it's almost anti-Christ in many ways. The first point is this. It comes out of verse 11, and you can write this down. A follower of Jesus is a foreigner and an exile. Peter said it. He says, dear friends, once again, reminding them their identity as family and of children of God. He's urging, he's pleading, and he says, as foreigners and exiles. Now, uh, foreigners and exiles, what he's literally saying is, he's using two great terms here, and I want to try to define them because I think they ought to define you. Foreigner. A foreigner is somebody who is a pilgrim, who's moving through, he's temporary, he has eventually got a home that he's moving on to, he is here just for a part of the journey, and that's why he is here. The difference between an immigrant and a a foreigner, an immigrant comes to take up permanent residence uh, in, in, in a new place, whereas a foreigner is just making their way through. And he's saying, you are foreigners. You, as followers of Jesus, you're just moving through. This is not home. This is not your final stop. You, you are moving through here. You belong to a kingdom that is not of this world. And that is why you're just moving through. And that's why as a follower of Jesus Christ, if his spirit indwells you, there's times that you wake up and you read the paper or you, uh, you watch the news and you think, I don't belong here. I just don't, do any of you feel that way? I just don't belong here. There's something that just doesn't settle with me here. And he calls them foreigners. But the second term he uses is your exiles. Now what an exile is, an exile is one who um, is unable to be in their final destination in their home country right now. Something is permitting them from uh, not being able to enter into their their country. In other words, they are there, and, and we have uh, exiles today. They're, they can't go back to their countries because they're war-torn, or they're not welcomed, or, or whatever. And it's that way for you as a follower of Jesus. He, Peter is getting across. He's saying, listen, he says, you're exiles. You cannot come fully into the kingdom. One day, Jesus is going to establish the kingdom forever, and you will be welcomed in. But right now, you, it just can't happen. And uh, what, what he's saying here, and I hope this registers, you as followers of Jesus are foreigners and you're exiles while you're here on this earth. The problem is many of us have become way too attached and we think this is all there is. In fact, one of the, the original meanings that the words foreigner and alien mean is that not only are you a foreigner and alien, but you are residing among those who do consider this permanent. And what that means is, is that we cannot play hideout from the world. I think too many Christians or instead of dwelling among those that are here to make an influence, we are hiding out, we are playing holy huddle, and thus we've lost our influence. And I'm afraid we're becoming flavorless salt. Because what we're called to do is bring influence, but you got to realize this is not your home. You're just passing through. You, you're here for a time, but, but it is going to be a time that is short-lived. And we are guilty sometimes 
instead of making influence, we're guilty of gathering, and I believe that we are to gather, but we're guilty sometimes, instead of letting our light so shine before men that they may see our good works, give glory to our Father in heaven, what we're doing is we're shining our lights on each other. If you're going to make a difference in your neighborhood, which you are living as a foreigner and an exile among people that consider this their permanent home, you've got to make a difference of influence while you're there. That's the first thing that Peter is getting across to them. The second one is this. You can write this down. A follower of Jesus should be different. I almost want to change that and say, must be different. If God's spirit indwells you, you must be different. You should be different. One of the, one of the things that I hear often is that the reasons Christians do not have a voice today is because we look just like the world. The only difference is, is we come to a place on Sunday that they don't. We must be different. And, and what Peter says here, he says, he gives a couple of instructions. In verse 11 again, he says, abstain from sin, sinful desire. Abstain from sinful desire. Well, what is sinful desire? I mean, just the thought, the temptation. Well, really what he's referring to here is the flesh unchecked. You know, it's interesting that people say with children, children just, if you just put them in a room together, they'll learn to get along and treat each other fine. <laughs> you know as well as I do that that's the, the farthest thing from the truth. They have little fleshly natures and those fleshly natures just take over. And if those fleshly natures are unchecked, it's out of control. And so what Peter is saying here is you need to restrain and abstain those fleshly natures that want to control so much. And uh, Paul said, you live by the Spirit so you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Listen, my flesh is so strong. It's amazing how I can just have a quiet time or a prayer time or a worship time. And the next thing I know, I'm tempted to do the most worst things I can think about. And so what, what Peter is really saying is, is that, listen, if we're going to be different, we got to live different. We got to live different. We got to have a standard. We, and, 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 and it's not uh, a code of conduct. It's not, uh, it's not we're, we're just trying to, to live a, a way. And, and I'll get to that in just a moment. But notice what else Peter says here. He says, this sinful desires that wage war against your soul. Now, I want you to grab this. He is not saying it's a one-time conflict. He is saying this is a war that's been waged that's going to continue until you're out of these bodies. It's a military campaign picture uh, that's coming against you. So, students go to camp. They make commitments. They repent of things. You have a quiet time. You come to a worship service. You, 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 you abstain from things. You repent of the way God has you. And then you think, well, that's it. Well, the next morning, you get hit in the face with the same temptation. It's because it's a campaign to come against your soul constantly. As long as you're in this earth suit, you're going to battle these things. And so he says, abstain. Abstain from th these things. Mahatma Gandhi Many of you have heard the name of Mahatma Gandhi. He's one of the most respected leaders of modern history, in fact. He was a Hindu, but Gandhi nevertheless admired Jesus greatly, and he quoted often the Sermon on the Mount. E. Stanley Jones, the great pastor, went, and uh, he asked Mahatma Gandhi this question. He said, Mr. Gandhi, though you quote the words of Christ often, why is it that you appear to so adamantly reject becoming his follower? And Gandhi replied, oh, I don't reject your Christ. I love your Christ. It's just that so many of you Christians are so unlike your Christ. And what had happened is, is Gandhi, as a young man, was reflecting over possibility, possibility of becoming a Christian. And he went to a church and he was told he could not come in because of the caste that he was part of 
in the Hindu society. And he decided at that point to walk away. Think of how history would have been so much different. Abstain from sinful desires. But notice the next thing that Peter says. He says, live a good life. And, and all of us in this room, if you say, are you good? Yeah, I'm a good, good person. You know, you live a good life. But the word good here is not just, it's not a code of conduct, okay? It's not a religious um, uh, acting. See, because that's just moralism. Sometimes the Christian church is guilty of getting you to act a certain way so that people will think you are Christians, and what is actually going on is you're just acting a particular way. He says, live a good life. The good life is translation, beautiful, authentic, attractive. Peter, uh, Paul calls it a sweet aroma that others receive. This is what... Uh, this is what is referred to here in the scriptures as good, attractive, beautiful, transparent, authentic, consistent. These are the kind of lives that we are to live as followers of Jesus. So you can see why the world has every reason to think Jesus isn't real because of the picture sometimes that, that we give it, and it, it literally, it's this. It's the inward made visible. It's the inward, if God's spirit indwells you. See, when you become a Christian, God's spirit indwells you. And he starts to work from the inside out. We are so guilty of, of sometimes measuring faith by the outside. But we are so guilty of taking young believers or celebrity believers and then making them the spokesperson and the Spirit hasn't had a chance to work from the inside out to mature them. And we wonder why they fall. So that's what it is. It's the inside becoming visible uh, is what that is. In 1938, a guy by the name of Roy Plunkett he was looking for a non-toxic refrigerant. He worked for DuPont. And he's, he put some things in cylinders. He put some things in one cylinder. And he noticed, he experimented in it. And when he, when he undid the cylinder, what he discovered is, is that he hadn't developed a non-toxic refrigerant. What he had developed was a very slick uh, back, uh, a slick surface, you put it on a surface, it was incredibly slick. We have come to know it today as Teflon. In 1938, it was discovered, Teflon. Now we have it on cooking because it, it's non-stick and these kind of things. We as Christ followers ought to live certain lives that are like Teflon. If somebody accuses us, our lives ought to be so different that it can't stick. They know it's a rumor. What's sad is today, and this is, it's just, it's a burden to me. I, I, I read so many Christian blogs of pastors that have fallen and Christian uh, people that have fallen. And, and uh, I'm just thinking, gosh, who's next? You know? I mean, where's the Teflon living? I want to live my life in such a way as that. And why are we to be different anyway? It's so that these arguments and accusations will fall away and new believers will be drawn into the kingdom so we can influence. Let me quickly get on to the third one here. In verse uh, 13, he kind of makes a shift and he starts talking about submitting to human authority or earthly authority. And so my third point is this. A follower of Jesus has a mission while they're here. You have a mission. You're not just to live it out so that one day you go to heaven, you have a purpose, and God will use the suffering for that. And he says this, you are to submit to earthly authority. What does that mean? Because that's, that's kind of tough. In fact, uh, Peter's going to deal with three authorities. He's going to deal with the authority of the family, the authority of the church, the authority of the government. And he is saying you need to submit and pray for the emperor. Pray for those that are in charge. You need to do this. And sometimes we as Christ followers are so busy yelling at the government that we are not respecting and honoring the government. And, 
And Peter comes along and says, you need to submit to the authorities. Well, that, they are authority. They are to protect the people that are of that land. That is what they are there to do. They, uh, you, you live within the system that is there. You respect those that are in authority. And let me just kind of get personal here just a moment. Nothing bothers me more. Well, it, yeah, there are some things that bother me more. But, but this really bothers me is when uh, our president, whether it was President Obama or it's President Trump, for some reason, we have just decided to say, oh, that was Obama. That's Trump. Listen, I don't care whether you agree with the president or not. Let's have enough respect to call him President Obama or President Trump. There's a reason that we are to honor them because God has allowed them to be in charge. And many Christ followers are so busy throwing stones, but we're not showing any respect. And so we have got to be careful in this area. He says, he says submit to earthly authority. And... And sometimes we think, well, Mark, what about, what about when uh, they go against the, the Christian way of thinking? They go against our God and they ask us to do things that are against our God. What, what should we do at that point? Number one is, very seldom does that happen. People use that as an excuse. But Peter himself was arrested. And uh, I looked back in the scriptures. I just wanted to see this a little bit. I thought about... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I thought about Daniel. I thought about uh, Joseph. I thought about uh, Nehemiah. I thought about Peter in the New Testament. You know, when Peter was arrested, he was arrested for his faith. And he was brought on account for his faith. He told him respectfully, listen, I hear what you're saying, but you got to know I answer to a higher authority. I cannot be quiet about this. He never threw rocks at them about that. He just firmly said, I answer to a higher authority. See, we as Christ followers ought to answer to a higher authority. Yes, when we need to, but we have to be careful. I heard a quote yesterday. We went to a, a conference, Pam and I, and uh, they said this, it won't be the White House that changes our country, but my house. And I thought, man, if we as Christians would abide by that. Do we have a voice? Yes. Can we vote? Yes. Can we run for political office? Yes. But we got to have our house in order. In Jeremiah chapter 29, and many of you take Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans for half for you, and you put it on t-shirts and coffee mugs, and I don't think anybody really knows the source of where that came from when they do that. We use it as a good luck charm. But you, when you read the whole of what's taking place there, the children of Israel, the Jewish nation, has been exiled to Babylon. And Jeremiah tells them this, and I want you to hear this in reference to what I've been saying. He says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. In other words, what, what Jeremiah is telling them, where you are in exile, you be the best citizens that they have. And I don't know if that's said about our country that Christians are the best citizens of our nation. But we should be. And that's what we're called to right here in the scriptures. A follower of Jesus has a mission. I think Peter is calling us to a higher way of living. And if we're going to make a difference in our, in our world, we have got to live on mission I want to wrap this up by letting you into my personal world just a moment. I, um, I journal, and uh, I was just praying through the message. 
And uh, the Lord started just germinating some things in my spirit. And so I started it out by saying, I'm just going to read it as it is. I have a dream, kind of a Martin Luther King kind of thing. I have a dream that someday the church will have a renewed spiritual awakening. God will visit us with such a manifest presence of his power that we can't help but repent in humility for the picture that we have given to the world of how Jesus truly is. We will awaken to the truth that we have lived life selfishly instead of loving all peoples, despite that they may be different than me. I envision a church that openly loves all people, a place and community where people can experience the mercy and love of Christ and unload their packs of guilt and shame. A community that lives life on mission and with purpose. That an authenticity and transparency exist in such a way that we do not brag about our way of living or our accomplishment, but we display Christ in such a way that people hunger <clears throat> for him. I envision a community that loves in such a way that people want to be a part simply because of what they see and experience. I envision a community where brokenness and humility are common. Mercy and grace flow as we hunger for him. I envision a community where true joy is present, that songs and prayers are lifted up by all, and we celebrate the true Jesus. I envision a community where truth is lived in all, and all are welcome. Is this possible in our day? Have we so drifted from God's beautiful picture of his bride? Have the walls of religious separation been built so high that we are not able to break them down? Have we so put off seeking, hurting, bound up individuals that they are not willing to give God another chance? Are we living good lives? Good, beautiful, lovely, transparent, authentic lives. Does this describe the church today? Does this describe central? Does this describe me? Lord, paint this vision on my mind's eye. Tattoo it upon my heart. Burn it in my bones until it becomes a growing reality. That's my prayer. And I think that's what Peter, he knew the people of God must be different if we're going to make influence.